Husky. Husky. Right Perfect. Getting good pictures. We'll head out towards me. Okay. Okay, you're done. Got an X like that once. <laughs> and then just look at me. Perfect. Hey guys, special treat today. Got my buddy Jeff Morrill from Temple Bay. He's been a friend for a long time. Known you a long time. Yes. He's the manager at Temple Bay. You've been there how many years? Well, this is going to be a longer story now. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, managing since mm, 2011, more or less. Uh, managing on my own since 2013. But I've been at Temple Bay for a long time prior yeah. to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I got to the area. All right, when I reached out to our YouTube community on what they wanted to know about planning a quote-unquote musky trip, but it kind of, it's also just any trip to Canada because there's lots of people that it might be their very first time coming to Canada. What are some of the basics that they need to know? And just starting with like housekeeping versus American plan and how that might affect a stay because I don't know that a lot of people fully understand what that means. Okay, so housekeeping is more or less you're going to kind of do it on your own. You're just renting a cabin. You can still rent a boat, but you're cooking your own meals. And for the, the seasoned veteran who's been out there lots or maybe been on that lake lots, it, it, it does work out better. You could come and go as you please. You want to go out at 4.30 in the morning and come back at 9.30 at night or something like that? Yes, you can do that. You don't have to worry about meals or nothing like that. But what we do is for like what we do for American Plan when we offer that for our customers, people think, well, I don't want to be stuck having breakfast at you know six thirty and supper at five thirty and, and regimented times. We have it set up so that you could just grab a, a breakfast sandwich and go. Your lunch is pre-made already, and we can wrap your plate, and you can eat it whatever time after dark you want. If you do hire a guide, and that's another question that comes up a lot is. Do I hire a guide or do I, like musky anglers want to do with the big puffed out chest, I want to do it on my own. And a lot of guys come <laughs> up to Canada and they want to they wanna conquer Eagle Lake or any of the other major lakes here on their own. And as a local who fishes Eagle Lake a lot, it nothing comes easy out there. I fished with some of the best guys out there that, that I know and it, it's still tough. So... Going with a guide at any of the camps nice. that you're at, and there's so many great guides out there, they're going to show you, yeah, the fast track on, here's what the pattern is that week, and here's at least a starting point on the gear. And for new people coming up, that's probably the best money they can spend is, is get a guide or something else I always tell people, reach out to your camp manager and ask the questions. And at, I'd asked Jeff this before. I'm like, there's no dumb questions, right? Like you've heard, no, you've I, heard every question. I get asked a lot of different questions. And yeah. that's what you're there for, right? Like you're there to answer their questions. Again, not just for Temple Bay, but how would you steer somebody to finding the right trip? I would say, okay, you should write these questions down on a piece of paper and ask yourself, what do I want? And if you, if you, the more questions you get, the more, and the more questions you ask, like I said, it's going to paint that picture a lot clearer. But if you said, okay, I want a smaller lake because I don't want to navigate a bigger lake. I want, uh, and I don't, I don't care about a 54 inch. I just want to catch, you know, I want my son to catch a couple of muskies. Right. So he's interested. Awesome. So he'll come with me next year. Mm -hmm. I want, you know, I mean, and a lot of people I think that are smart enough now they can go online and you can look at <clears throat> the area, the lake. You can see the different pictures of a uh, of fish. Oh, oh, these caps are on that lake, and you can see the fish and the pictures. You can see, you know, uh, maybe oh, that's caught from. I can tell by the background. Right, it's, guys, it's a big basin. Right there, it's a big basin yeah. fish. You know what I mean? It's got big do. girth and whatever else, that kind that's of stuff. You can tell by information more. seeking. And like I said, the more information you seek, the the clearer the picture is going to be. Call around. A lot of people don't even understand that we have, say, housekeeping. You know what I mean? They think, oh, that place yeah. is, you know, it's probably too expensive for us kind yeah. of thing. We'll just go over here because it's going to be cheaper. That's right. But you don't know unless you call. And, and, I'm saying there's yeah. places up north, you know, on different lakes and stuff around that uh, that maybe they have a, a 
better package even yet. Hey, we're going to throw a guide in with you. Maybe you don't have this kind of boat. And yes, the price is the same, but we're going to throw a guide in with you for a day or two or something like that to yeah. get you started off. Like there's a lot of different things that, and you can negotiate a little bit, believe it or not. It's not just stuck to the price. Mm -hmm. If you want to come in September or October, a lot of places, you know, they're, they're maybe not as busy or as full. Yeah. And you could say, hey, if I come in September and I bring this many guys and I take this package, you know, could you, would you throw in a guy? I just, I just want to say thanks, Jeff. I really appreciate this. I'm sure the viewers will appreciate it. And I will link Temple Bay in the bottom, like in the description here. And even if you're not coming to Temple Bay, don't hound them with every question in the world. But if you want to talk to somebody that knows this area, Jeff knows this area. And again, there's no stupid questions. No, call I'd rather and call and ask. Or if you want to stay at any other thing, just that's what yeah. we urge you to do. Call and ask. It, it may not be, you know, our place, but I'm saying is I can help you get to the right place. Yeah. It may it may not be it. Maybe you're looking for a fly-in and you want this, and I can suggest some great places because I've been to a lot of them. Yep. I say, hey, I know that they offer this and they offer that, and that's what I try to do for our whole area, is try to steer people, listen to what they're asking you, and steer them in the right direction of what they're looking for. Yep. So. Yep. That's what it's all about. All right. I appreciate you it, bet, Jeff. Kyle. Thank you. Okay, guys. So I'm here with my buddy Kyle from Cabbage. <laughs> cabbage dragon media that's a tongue twister sometimes but he's got a really cool youtube channel i'll have it linked down in the description and below anybody who follows me on socials know that i really like what kyle does and love the storytelling aspect and the adventure aspect and how i came on to his stuff was actually his eagle lake content which surprisingly enough is not very far from my brother-in-law and sister-in-law's cabin so when i did reach out to kyle it turns out we're kind of like-minded souls and the musky fishing obviously drew us together but i really like his approach to fishing his approach to video and we've talked a lot away from youtube and kyle somebody i consider a friend now and i always you know i always look forward to chatting with them so first off kyle you know thanks for coming on here and i'm sure your outlook on planning a canadian trip will be beneficial to the viewers yeah, I appreciate the invite and the opportunity to, I guess, make my introduction on the 54 bus channel here and hopefully provide some, um, I guess, American perspective on what it takes to do a Canadian Shield trip, I guess. How long have you been coming to Canada? And now that you were, from what I gather, kind of doing the trips on your own, what has changed in that you know period of time? And how do you view how it used to be coming to Canada when either it was your dad or your uncle or your granddad planning it versus how you're planning it now. Yeah, it's, it's definitely evolved. So I started going to Canada with my grandfather and we kind of kicked it off with Lake of the Woods when I was 10 years old. He'd always take me on kind of an annual trip. I've been very fortunate to have that relationship with him. And, um, when I turned 12 or so, we started going to Eagle and that's when kind of Eagle really grabbed my soul if you will and kind of sucked me in and and my grandfather was very hands-on with me at a young age like he involved me in a lot of the planning process for the gear we'd need to bring and kind of what to expect on the trip and whatnot so i had a general idea but over time as you grow and age it kind of transitioned from less of a trip with just my grandfather to let's bring some friends and kind of show them what the canadian shield thing is like and um i've been going to Eagle for, I want to say last year was my 20th year, but there was a break in there at the pandemic and I missed a year when I was 13 or so. Um, so there's, there's a few breaks in there, but what I'll tell you is that you can never be too prepared for a trip like this. And when you start planning these trips and kind of taking the whole preparation side into your own hands, your success for that week is going to be heavily dictated by the prep work you put into it. And that includes, you know, understanding what the weather has been doing up to that point. We're headed up. We're staying at Pine Beach Lodge again. I'll link all their information below. Great place to stay, guys. Rick and Allie are just absolutely fantastic. And uh, we're really looking forward to the trip. The weather looks really bitey, really bitey. So hopefully that's in our favor. We need a little bit of musky redemption. If you watched our trip last year, it was a complete dud. 
Um, as Glenn McDonald from 54 Bus has mentioned in the past, when you hit those bluebird days up on Eagle, it can completely shut that lake down and it shut it down last year. Where you stay at Pine Beach Lodge, it's, it's not just a five minute ride into town, be at my wife's shop at Bobby's or into Dryden at, you know, one of the big box stores to just get supplies. And I don't think people fully take that into account. They just think, oh, we're going up to a lodge. Everything's going to be good. If we, you know, if we need something, we'll just run down to wherever and grab it. And in Canada, a lot of the spots are, even if it's not remote in the, you know, the biggest sense of the word, they're fairly remote. You're, you know, you're a half hour, 45 minutes or an hour away from any kind of store for anything. And just to piggyback on what you said, I think something that people don't plan enough is breakdowns on a trailer. We see it so often and guys coming to Canada, they have a wheel bearing go or a flat tire or two flat tires or the lights go on their trailer and they're not prepared for that. And I know you, you plan for those eventualities. And that's a big part of, again, a successful trip, because if you cross the border into Canada and you get a flat tire on the 502 and you don't have a spare or you've already used it, your trip's almost over before it began. So maybe just touch on that side of it a bit more. Yeah. I, it, like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a old soul from the perspective of like, I like to do a lot of prep work versus reactive work when it comes to my equipment. <laughs> so generally before I go on a trip to Eagle, which is about a nine hour from my driveway to the lodge with a stop at the border and, you know, some stops for gas, it's about a nine hour trip. And, Generally speaking, before that, I like to completely disassemble my wheel bearings and completely repack them and do those sorts of kind of preventative type measures on that stuff. Because the last thing you want to deal with is, um, you know, a broken down trailer on the side of the road, if you will. And, you know, it can be as simple as changing the fuel water separator filter on your boat and some of those little headaches that could pop up throughout the week. Or, you know, I, I run an older boat, so I have a fuel water separator filter on it. and when that air code trips, the engine goes into limp mode. And the last thing you want to do is be on the south end of Eagle and a storm kicks up and you have a 40 minute boat ride back in limp mode in those sorts of situations. Right. So just being overly cautious, knowing where you're located. I, I know, like, I think Garmin, not to plug a brand or anything on here, but I think they have like an in reach device. Um, if you don't have cell coverage where you're at, that could, you know, per, potentially protect you in the event of an emergency, but you can never be too prepared. First aid kits, flares, life jackets in the boat, all of those things, along with kind of the preparatory, I guess, maintenance side of, you know, towing a boat that far. And and these aren't easy roads to travel, as you know, Glenn. I mean, you've driven down Detour Point Road and some of the back gravel roads that go to like a Pine Beach Lodge, for an example. Like these are not paved pretty trails, you know, they're, they're pretty narrow in spots and littered with potholes. So um, it's pretty hard on your equipment and the more prep work you can do and the more maintenance you, you can do ahead of the trip, the better off you're going to be that you get up there in one piece and you can spend your time fishing versus fixing your equipment. Yeah. And I think that goes back to that research and just using Pine Beach Lodge as an example, when you do get off of what we would call the hard top or the pavement road, you have about eight give or take eight miles or seven miles of gravel road and it's it's like old logging road that it's rough it's narrow it's one lane you might meet some people and there's no you know no real pull-offs and there the last couple of years as kyle will know there was a washout that was haphazardly fixed and as you you know drive through it if you're not careful your motor could touch it just a lot of things to take into account and a lot of lodges up here you know keystone lodge on cedar it's another one it's down a logging road it's not terrible but by city standards it's not very good so you, you have to come in prepared for that kind of stuff and i just i think that's where some people they kind of fail in the planning side of it and I, like i heard you touch on water separator or you know like the fuel filters anything like that don't assume that the lodge you're going to is going to have any kind of spare parts for anything you have. They may have like a spare bilge pump. They may have, you know, a light or something to patch you up. Again, touching on what you said with like the Garmin outreach thing. A lot of times if, if you had trouble on the south part of Eagle or even the big part of Eagle, you're already 14, 15 miles from camp. And even if you were to get a hold of camp, 
it's not just easy for them to run over if there's a storm coming. In a lot of cases, you need to have, you know, an out of, I got to get out of this situation and, and you need to be prepared. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, we say all these things and we highlight the roads and the remoteness of it, but that's part of the appeal. My first trip entirely dedicated to fishing muskie and my first trip in August. My time away from Eagle Lake certainly amplified the anticipation, but that effect was further compounded because this would be the first time I would get to share this special place with my wife, Victoria. This is our 2022 Eagle Lake story. Right, like that's what appealed to me. And, and to go back to the first question you asked, Glenn, on like how did how has the trip evolved? When I first started going to Eagle, it was camp boats, no depth finders, no trolling motors, just a paper map that had some reefs kind of marked off, like this one's hittable, watch out for this one. And it was the adventure of it, right? That remoteness that drew me to it. It's so different from fishing Twin Cities Metro or um, you know, some of the local watersheds across Minnesota and Wisconsin. It's that remoteness side of it is is what appeals to me. And there's always a new spot that's holding fish that hasn't been found yet, at least by me, maybe by others. But, you know, it's that adventure side of it. And, it, and to kind of highlight and kind of bring this full circle here, it's like that's the appeal of it. But you also have to take matters into your own hands and be self-sufficient and go through this prep work. And if you've never done it before, just when you think you have everything ironed out in your plans, and even me, after going for years and years and years, there's always something that needs to be added to the checklist that you learn the hard way almost every single year. I heard you say one other thing about the planning side of it, and that's watching the weather. And I did write an article from Muskie Hunter, not to kind of toot my own horn, but a few years ago, talking about adverse weather, and that could be the dreaded flat, calm, post-frontal or that prefrontal, and you got something coming in and that it's a subject that gets talked about a lot. I'm going to talk to my buddy and your buddy, Kevin Wagner, about this topic about weather, because people, you pick a week, you plan a week, and you're hoping for overcast skies and like three mile an hour winds for the whole week. And very rarely does that happen. So you need to be able to figure out a way around it. How do you approach that, Kyle? Well, it's a great question and it's it's one that i don't know that i have fully perfected up to this point but what i like to do when i boil down one of these trips is think in terms of like what you can control and you you can control a few things right the month you choose and then the lunar phase within that whether you want to fish new moon full moons some period in between um kind of whatever your superstition is around that or belief system is around that you can control that timing for the most part you can't control water levels. You can't control weed growth. You can't control if there's rusty crayfish in a water body that decimates weed beds from one year to the next. You can't control any of that, right? But as far as weather is concerned, you can take steps to maybe not prevent weather from being unfavorable during your week there, but at least putting you in a position so when you get there on day one, you have a general idea of what's been happening with the system. So what I've found and this is a little bit of a crude way to do it and there's probably a better way to do this but what i like to do is the week leading up to my trip i like to open the weather app on my phone i use i think it's weather bug as an example but it gives me the location and what the wind is doing as well as what the temperature is doing and i like to take a screenshot and i put it in a separate album in my phone and i do that three to four times throughout the day and i try to do it at the same time in those intervals every single day leading up to it and what that allows me to see is as i flip through them quickly what did the weather do how fast did things get warm throughout the week did we have storms throughout the week what has the wind been doing for the last three to four days and all of these sorts of kind of weather patterns and and kind of wind shifts and wind direction changes will kind of give me a general idea because i know eagle relatively well at least some of the areas i fish It'll give me a general idea of where to start and what the fish may be doing. And I'll have an idea of if there's a storm front coming in and it's been consistent weather for four days, I know these fish will be charged up. Or like what happened last year is we had storms the day we were coming into the trip and kind of tailing off. What ended up happening is those storms were supposed to persist throughout the next day. And we thought the bite was going to be really good. It wasn't, it ended up being flat calm, bluebird, it changed on us. But I, I knew based on the weather patterns that I had been tracking in my phone, 
kind of what had occurred and where fish may be relating in the different basins and, and um, kind of sections of the lake based on where bait fish may have pushed given water temps and time of year and some of those things. You have a starting point. And I think a lot of people, they come up here and they're so excited to get up here and just go fishing that they miss a lot of those little details. So you get here on the back of a really cool storm or a really flat calm and you, you start to get out fishing and then it switches. Well, now you're chasing that bite instead of starting where you had a good starting point. And I think your approach works a lot better than chasing a bite. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, to the chasing the bite point, like if you're not tracking that ahead of time, you're just going off the data you have as soon as you step on the water and what's going on with the weather at that point. And you, like I said, you could be on the front of something that's really special that could lead into identifying a pattern very early in the week and then riding that out throughout the rest of the week. Or you could be coming off the tail end of something and it may lead you to draw conclusions that aren't going to hold true for the next few days, right? If you're coming off of a storm front or, or something of that nature. So I think, you know, these fish are hard enough to catch. Whatever you can do to prepare for a trip that you've had planned for a year or six months or whatever the case may be, whatever you can do leading up to that week is only going to play to your advantage once you get on the water and trying to break down these large shield systems. If you could leave with maybe like one big tip, like one big takeaway that viewers looking at either their very first time to Eagle or a shield lake, or maybe it's their 10th or 20th time like you, what, what's one piece of advice that you, you know, think that will really help set them up to get, you know, the most out of a Canadian trip? Oh, that's a good question. I could go a lot of different directions with this, but I'm actually probably going to, I'm going to give two tips. The first one is do your research in terms of if, if it's your first time ever on a body of water, like Eagle, do your research on the different basins and the caliber of fish they can hold and the water clarity and the different sorts of structural elements. Um, a lake that big without good mapping can be very difficult to break down, but there is information available online if you're willing to use Google. And then to kind of compound on that through the research pro um, process side of things, like use your network. Like, And if you don't have a network, what I found about the muskie industry is that if you send people a message like Glenn or myself, People are willing to help out to the extent they're able to. Again, Kyle, really appreciate it. And we will talk soon. Yeah, appreciate it, Glenn. Thanks. Well, hello, Glenn. Good to be here. Um, for those that don't know who I am, I'm from the industry. Um, but I also make my living selling hunting and fishing and outdoor equipment, fishing rods and line. Um, but I also am an avid fisherman. I've saw my first muskie caught when I was five years old and I was hooked ever since. So my vocation and my avocation uh, blend together. And I've been in the outdoor sporting goods industry from a sales rep side for the last 30 plus years. Well, that gives Kevin a unique take on the industry. And some of our viewers know that I mentioned your name quite a bit and you're always kind of my go-to when I need an answer on something industry related or a lot of times it's just personal life stuff. I look up to you as a mentor and I really value, you know, your insights on, you know, what goes on in this industry and, and in a broader sense, like this planning a trip. So kind of to get into it, Kevin, you and I've talked about it in the past couple of years and you started to describe to me how you plan a trip for you and your group when you come to Canada. I'm gonna just kind of let you take it away and after the fact, Kevin will send me a couple stills of some of his planning so I can show you guys a little bit as we kind of, you know, go, excuse me, go through this. Well, thank you, Glenn. And so what I like to do is a lot of us don't get to spend a lot of time in Canada on a trip. So I value that time. And we've been to so many seminars over the years where we've listened to people talk about sunrise and sunset and moonrise and moonset or moon overhead and moon underfoot but yet we still get up at eight o'clock and we eat breakfast and we pack our lunch and we go out in the boat and we fish until it's dinner time and then we come back in and we do the same thing over and over again i thought i really want to maximize our time so already for this summer 
I have when the moon rise and moon set, the sunrise and sunset, the moon overhead, moon underfoot. I plan out each day and I look at, first of all, when is sunrise? And I wanna fish those three hours that surround sunrise. I wanna fish those three hours that sunset. That's fairly easy to do. But then I also look at the key moon phases throughout the day. And we move our meal times or our fishing times around when those key moon phases are. We get down even actually where earlier in the week, we look at when we first get to the water, where have the primary winds been coming from, where have they been blowing to? So we know where we're gonna start on the lake. And by the second or third day, then we've established a little bit of a milk run. And then we start shifting over more to a milk run. Yeah, and I think taking that approach and trying to be on the water at those key times is super important. And it's something that Dave and I have adopted and Richie, even from Eagle Lake, trying to pick those optimum times because you you can easily get burnt out if you just spend all day on the water and then you get, you know, a moon set or a moon rise at sunset and you're burnt out and you don't want to be out there. And I think it's not for everybody to want to be on the water at all the key times. And I know that's something you touch on. Some guys, they just want to fish, you know, part of the day and Part of the appeal of a Canadian trip is just sitting on the deck, having a cocktail, smoking a cigar for some guys. So it's not for everybody, but when you're coming up here and you're planning to get the most out of your time, how do you plan that day so that you can maximize the time and not fall into the trap at breakfast at nine, lunch at noon and dinner at six? We actually have a, well, I should say we, I have a spreadsheet that breaks it down by the hour but I share it with my fishing trip partners long in advance. And so I, the people that I go on trips with have bought into this system with me. We actually start out where we have those first three hours of the day with the sunrise. But then after that, we may take a break. That's maybe when we take a, a breakfast break or um, maybe even a little time for a nap if we fish late the night before. And we adjust, then we look at when is the midday moon phase, whether it's a, a moonrise, moonset, uh, or an overhead or underfoot. And we make sure that we're fishing those two or three hours really consistently uh, around those areas. The other times we actually take breaks. So we make sure that we're rested, that we're well fed, um, so that we can be very focused at the key times. So there's usually about four three to four really intense three hour time periods that we're fishing really hard in those off times we actually plan trolling runs or um looking for new areas so we learn a weed bed or we learn a rock point or we learn mid lake structures and we're kind of mapping it out so we can come back to it at key times and then fish it at those key times with intensity as opposed to at the end of the day when you're completely burnt out and uh make a bad figure eight or a bad hook set or whatever might happen when you're fatigued. Yeah, that's interesting. And that's something that Kyle talked about in our previous segment here, kind of knowing where to be on the water at the right time of day. And Kyle's big on following the weather. And I had mentioned that you follow the weather as well, Kevin. I know you're big on the prevailing winds. Maybe touch on that because I think, again, going back to what I said with Kyle, a lot of people, they just, the weather's going to be the weather and they deal with it when they get here. And that's a bit of a haphazard approach, especially on these big shield lakes. You can get yourself caught into a pattern that you may have success right away, but it's not, you can't replicate that as weather changes. And I know you're somebody that likes to stay on top of that. Yeah, I'm always looking. The one thing I can't plan in advance is the weather. Even though the week before I'm watching where the prevailing winds and the temperatures are gonna be, when I get to a lake for the first time, I like to first fish the downwind side of the lake because that's where it's been pushing all of the, the bait fish and whatever else that goes along with it. That's the first part of the lake that I break down. And then we break it down by shorelines, weeds, mid lake structures, rocks, whatever. We try to break those areas out and see if there's any fish in those areas. But then we also watch the weather. If we know we have a weather pattern coming in, it trumps everything else. And if we see a weather pattern coming in, we want to really, we really want to fish the front side of that weather pattern. But we also want to see where the wind is blowing. If all of a sudden it was blowing um, into a reef one way 
and then the next day the wind has shifted we want to fish that reef a different way we want to fish the current patterns not only the wind current patterns but the lake current patterns and how they get affected by that new weather pattern that's coming in and and I, it's funny glenn because i think you touched upon it just recently and i know you and i've talked about it a lot i'm always watching how that wind is pushing around a point the water on the point uh, I, I'm a, I don't know, I'm an old river rat, so I'm always paying attention to the way the wind is moving water and how the fish is going to set up, because I think that fish is always setting up watching the bait fish come by its face, and I want to make sure that I'm working that structure and presenting my bait in that same way. That's interesting you brought that up. When Kevin was up here in like 2019, I believe it was before COVID, he jumped in the boat with Dave and I, and we had an interesting day on Indian Lake chain. And you have a lot of experience there from the past. And you were showing us some of these techniques and the one area you guys call it the L. So mm -hmm. anybody that knows that area might be able to kind of guess where that is. But David and I went in and we're going to fish it a particular way. We always fish out the port side of the boat and we always try to, you know, work forward that way. But you're like the, current's kind of coming the other way and i feel like you guys need to be casting you know up into the current and pulling your baits down the other way and not that we kind of bought in that day but dave ended up moving a really nice fish that day kind of adopting that strategy and that stuck with dave and i and you're right i do talk about that a lot and i reference you a lot because of that and not only is it current it's wind when wind is pushing over a rock shoal or a point you want to cast up into the wind. And I know a lot of guys have trouble with casting into the wind or boat control. And it it's one of those things, when, especially on a big shield lake, you really need to learn boat control and you really need to learn effective casting coming up to a shield lake. And, and I know you're going to tell me this. You can't just go on a spot and just cast willy nilly and hope for the best. You have to have a targeted approach, right, Kev? exactly you've got to know or at least in your mind you have to envision it and you have to see which way that fish is setting up how it's looking for bait and then you have to present your lure in that way at least the way you see it in your mind's eye we're not right all the time but at least i want to put those odds in my favor and glenn i remember vividly when we fished that spot because i remember dave kind of look at looking at me a little quizzically and and uh we started fishing it i think he said something like, we're never going to see a fish at this spot. And all of a sudden he saw that really nice, it was a mid forties inch fish come cruising in. And, and uh, uh, it, it was a fun day. I, I, I love fishing with you guys, but I remember, I remember that, that time uh, vividly as well. Yeah, we do too. And we talk about it a lot and we're hoping that as we kind of, you know, get through the next couple of years, we'll have a little bit more time to fish together. You and I got out last year together. Unfortunately, we, we had a tough day on cedar we did actually move a lot of fish it yeah. just didn't happen that day and and that's fishing that's part of it um but i always appreciate you know all the advice you give us and it's something that even how we've talked about tyla's dad even though he's not teaching us at the moment we pick up on stuff later and i think you're the kind of guy that when you're whether you're talking to me or talking to the viewers here or you're doing a seminar at your canoe expo people are gathering tips and you you're somebody that's kind of seen it all and i i like that like you're i know you're a little bit older than me but you're an old soul in the sense that you you appreciate the way things were you know before all the technology and it's something that i think a lot of musky guys <clears throat> can appreciate at times especially on shield lakes where you don't have the great mapping the great you know the great um gps stuff that we would have or even just reefs being marked by camp so maybe just touch on how you would approach like a new lake like last year like cedar one that you hadn't been to before we'll kind of wrap up on that how do you plan for a lake that is brand new to you you know that is a great question i started touching on it a little bit earlier but i actually have in my notes how we start fishing a new lake and i love fishing new lakes and in fact, I typically will have a general lake map on my electronics, but I don't always use them. I will actually use the auto chart. So I'm the one doing the mapping. And I, as I mentioned earlier, I will go to the downwind side and then we'll start breaking apart. Beforehand, we're looking at the points and 
where we want to find reefs and bays or whatever it may be. And we start breaking it down. Um, and again, it's the downwind side because I think that's where everything's being pushed to. But then I'm auto charting with my locator as opposed to relying on a map that somebody already created. I like to create my own maps because I'm not predisposed how I want to fish it. I also tend not to look at other people's maps ahead of time because I don't like being predisposed to how I'm going to fish that area, depending upon the baits I want to use or the, the, the techniques I want to use. So I adjust how I'm going to fish an area or how I'm going to map an area based upon the lures I want to use on that area, if that makes sense. I don't know, Glenn, does it? And like you're saying there, I think, Kev, taking your time, mapping it out and learning as you go and not rushing through stuff. And I, again, back to how you kind of started the conversation, your time is limited, use it wisely, but don't rush through. I think that's a big mistake that people make here. I agree because a lot of people will see that jug on a reef and I didn't grow up when I first went to Eagle and to the area that you're in the Indian chain or the seat or whatever it was there, everything wasn't jugged the way it is today. And we had, we always had the little buoy markers. So we had to drive around, find the top of the reef and then drop one buoy marker and, and, and work our way out. The one thing is, is when you're fishing around that buoy marker, people tend to, I'll watch them and they tend to just make a concentric circle around it. And that is not how these reefs are shaped. <laughs> and so if you auto chart it, you're going to find a lot of little spines and little features on those reefs or even those points off of those uh, you'll see a main lake point that comes out and you think it just follows the, the shoreline and it doesn't. And if you auto chart that, it, it really brings it into view. It gives you, a, I think, a much better way to fish it. So what is the Minnesota Border Challenge? It's, it depends on who you ask. It's anywhere from 270 miles if you read the Water Tribe website. If you ask Siri, and you say, Siri, how far is it from International Falls, Minnesota? Do you see something behind you there that might be interesting to the viewers? And maybe just touch on that, and that'll kind of lead into um, you know, I'll put a link into that seminar because I think it, it was really interesting and it was something that I found very inspiring, even though I'm not doing any adventure canoe <laughs> races anytime soon, but I appreciate it, Kev. Yeah, um, I was fortunate. I've gone to some really remote areas, in fact, to chase muskies, and a lot of it's been from a canoe. I got asked from one of my fishing partners if he wanted or if I wanted to join their team to do the Kruger Waddell Minnesota Border Challenge, which goes from International Falls out to Grand Portage, Minnesota, which is on the shores of Lake Superior. And it's the old uh, fur traders run. And so it's been done forever since the 1600s. And people always tried to do it in under eight days. And it got fairly more organized in the early 2010s. And since it's been done, the people that have completed it in under eight days and two years ago was the first time that I got to do it uh, because COVID knocked it down the prior year. I'm the 37th person on a red paddle. And those are the people that have completed it since this event was, they've kept records of it. And that's that red, that red paddle behind me is a replica of that paddle. So I'm the 37th name on that paddle of people that have completed that run. Uh, the Kruger Waddell Minnesota Border Challenge. And then last year we did it again. And last year we did it in 82 hours and 56 minutes, which as best we can tell from any records that are out there is the fastest a three-man team has ever done it. Well, congratulations, Kevin. It, it was very interesting for us to kind of follow along and watch you. And I know we had spoke right after you did it. And 
for anybody that's at all interested in that kind of stuff, I highly recommend listening to Kevin's seminar. It's on another YouTube channel. The name escapes me at the moment. I will put a link, but your talk was very inspiring. And I think it's something that people in any, any sport or any discipline can probably take something from and to be part of, you know, such a small group and to accomplish such a goal. It just, it speaks volumes to your character and to who you are. So congratulations. Thank, thank you, Glenn. And it's funny. I, I tell my friends now I have something in common with, uh, with Taylor Swift and the Rolling Stones. I didn't know that this person was going to be uh, videotaping me. He's got a, a great little channel. Uh, he does some adventure racing. But uh, um, there is a bootleg copy of my seminar, which I'll share with you so that people can see what I talk about when I'm up on stage about this canoe race. Well, that's awesome, Kevin. I appreciate it. And I'm sure for the viewers, Kevin won't be um, a stranger around here. We're going to pick his brain a little bit more as we go into 2024 musky season, because you have a lot to offer, not only me, our viewers, but just some of your industry insider view. I think some of the viewers would like to hear some of that. So I'll be leaning on you a little bit more this year. So thank you. Glenn, thank you as always. I, I always enjoy our time. And Dave and Kyla, too. I think it's just uh, always, always enjoy your time. Old, bald, gray bearded, 60 year old guy sells fish hooks for a living without a gym membership. That's not a dopamine rush, there, folks. That's a serotonin rush. Nobody <laughs> could ever take that away from me. Pretty freaking cool. When you're done, my dad asked me, what do you get when you're done with that? You get these bare tooth necklaces and you get to sign your name on a red panel. On this red panel, it starts with Clint Waddell from 1968. I'm the 37th name on this panel. What's your red panel? Thank you.